Welcome back to the Psyche and Singularity series. I'm going over my book, Jungian Psychology and Holographic String Theory. So, in this video, I will be going over the chapter comparing Jung's theory of the mandala images of the self to Leonard Susskind's holographic string theory of information conservation in black holes and the inside out black hole universe. So this is chapter six in the book, Black Hole as Universal Mandala. So the, <clears throat> I think the probably the most important quote for this video and for this chapter comes from Memories, Dreams, Reflections. That's Jung's autobiography that uh, came out in 1961 after he died. And so he, discussed how he had been going through a midlife crisis throughout the duration of World War I. And he was drawn between the security of his job teaching at the University of Zurich um, and his lack of faith in the content that he was teaching, psychiatry. He was developing his new psychology of the collective unconscious mind, the archetypes of the unconscious mind which forced him to break from Sigmund Freud, who wanted Jung to be his protege, but Jung was rejecting the materialism that Freud based his psychology on. So Freud was assuming all of conscious activity can be reduced to material interactions in the brain, and Jung was breaking away from that. So he entered into this, this time of his life when he he was overwhelmed with images bubbling up from the unconscious mind. He felt like he was having a psychotic episode. He would have visions of, of you know, almost like dreams while he was waking of a guru-like figure he named Philemon and an anima figure, uh, Salome, and he felt like he had to delve into what appeared to be madness to try to confirm the existence of what he called the objective psyche. That just like there's an objective world outside of our mind, so too is there an objective world inside of our mind. It's not our figments of our imagination. There's a whole world there that's real, and he was trying to map that world out. So he was subjecting himself to this flood of psychic imagery. And after this ordeal that went on for, I guess, from 1913 to about 1918, he said this was his ultimate discovery. He says, I knew that in finding the mandala as an expression of the self, I had attained what was for me the ultimate. Perhaps someone else knows more, but not I. So this was the ultimate realization in his career as a scientific studier of the psyche, that the collective unconscious mind tries to compensate the conscious ego and the ultimate archetype from which all of the other archetypes emerge and back toward which they tend to reunite is the archetype of the self. And the psychic image that arises from that ultimate archetype is the mandala, which is a Sanskrit word that means he defines it as magic circle. And he gives examples from tantric texts, especially featuring Shiva as the ultimate deity in, a, in the central part of a circle, surrounded um, a lot of times also, the circle will have four symbols representing the cardinal points of the compass. So the, the quaternity, the structure of four, he also says is often found with the mandala. But what I want to focus on, <clears throat> and this was a, a major part of the book, so Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli theorized that every law of psychology should have a law of physics that parallels it because mind and matter both emerge from the unconscious, the collective unconscious archetypes, all culminating with the unus mundus, which is also known as the archetype of the self and the God archetype. So <clears throat> if it's a psychological law that when an ego is pulled by opposing demands, like Carl Jung's ego was, the demands of teaching, his teaching career, and his responsibility to support his family, the other demand to forge this new psychology of the archetypes of the collective unconscious, 
When a, mi when a mind and ego is pulled by these opposing demands, Jung says, after analyzing his own dreams and fantasizing uh, and his fantasies, and after analyzing a thousand of Wolfgang Pauli's dreams, the conclusion he came to, the ultimate conclusion, is that mandala images will emerge from the archetype of the self. Okay, then what is the physical correlate of the mandala, the psychic mandala images? If there is this parallel, as they say, between mind and matter, where do we see psychic images in the empirically observable objective outer world? And I say black holes perfectly fit the bill for what how Jung describes the, the power of the mandala image. What its function is in the psyche is equivalent to the function of a black hole in the cosmos. And the universe itself is an inside-out black hole. Each of us perceives ourselves as the center of a universe which is expanding away at an exponential rate, reaching the speed of light at the outermost sphere called the horizon of the cosmos. So if black holes are the... So black holes are invisible, but they have visible gravitational effects. So if the gravitational effects of black holes are the physical correlates of the psychic mandala images, and if the psychic mandala images emerge from the archetype of the self, then so do the black hole gravitational effects, which equates the archetype of the self with the gravitational singularity. Black holes emerge from singularities, psychic mandala images emerge from the self, the psychic mandala images and the black holes are emerging from the same archetype, so psyche equals singularity. So this parallel between black holes and Jung's mandala theory is another <clears throat> avenue of evidence supporting the equation psyche equals singularity, which was based on Jung's equation in the Leap Day letter of 1952, where he ended this letter saying, psyche equals highest intensity in the smallest space. So that is a gravitational singularity. The highest intensity of matter or energy is infinite, and the smallest space is zero volume. So that's a gravitational singularity. So that's the main point of the chapter on mandala images of the self, that black holes are the parallel and that implies the psyche equals singularity, but it also implies that the psyche equals the cosmic horizon of the universe because of the relationship between the gravitational singularity and, and the cosmic horizon, where according to both Carl Jung's near-death experience and Leonard Susskind's holographic string theory, every bit of information describing the three-dimensional interior volume of the universe is interwoven at each point from which it radiates back in on fundamental threads to create the holographic illusion of three-dimensional space. So a big part of the book is not only does psyche equal singularity, but psyche can be broken down to a pair of opposites, conscious and unconscious mind. And the singularity also has its polar opposite, which is the horizon of the cosmos. So to expand on the equation psyche equals singularity, I say self, the ultimate archetype of the self, which is the singularity. So self equals conscious, unconscious, equals singularity horizon. So the conscious and unconscious polarity of the mind, the physical correlate of that is the polarity between the central singularity and the horizon of the cosmos. And the self is the union of all opposites. So it's the union of the conscious and unconscious. So the equation is the conscious ego is equated with the central singularity from which the universe is expanding. Each of us, no matter where we are in the universe, we will perceive ourselves as the central point from which everything is expanding at an exponential rate. And the collective unconscious mind is correlated with the horizon of the cosmos, where, from where the entire empirically observable objective world is radiating in, just like Plato's theory of the absolute ideas imprinted on each soul. 
Plato says that the entire material world is like a dream projection from the eternal archetypes. So if the entire material world is radiating from the horizon of the cosmos, and if we equate the horizon of the cosmos with the collective unconscious mind, then that satisfies Plato's cosmology because all of the archetypes would be interwoven at each point of that encompassing sphere, and it's creating this illusion. Ill illusion, even Leonard Susskind uses the word illusion. It's a kind of an illusion. The more permanent reality is on the holographic film at the outermost sphere of the universe. So that's the basic outline that I'm, that's supporting the equation of the psyche and the singularity. So I'll now read a little bit from of the book here. And here is an example that Jung gives about mandalas appearing throughout religious traditions in the world. So to, as a preface to this, he's saying, all right, what kind of evidence do I need to show that there is an objectively existing psyche, a psychic world that we don't create, but that we live in? And he says, well, f first thing you need to do is observe these images in your own mind. And the, the, the most prominent image that can be traced throughout history, saying, is the mandala image. So do you see mandala images when you are being pulled between opposing demands? Then he says, you have to look at your contemporaries. Do other people who you live with in the same time and space, are they experiencing that? And finally, you need to look at the historical record of past ages to see, do the mandala images emerge when people are having religious crises, maybe that are explained in, in particular texts. And he's saying the mandala image is the one that shows up most frequently and most regularly. It satisfies those three criteria. You can analyze your own dreams and you'll find this image, he says. And if you ask your friends and they analyze their dreams, they'll find the same thing. And furthermore, if you look throughout the historical record, then the mandala will frequently emerge as the symbol of the ultimate god archetype. So, well, that was kind of a, let me just turn this ringer off here. Um, all right, so here's an example of that is from the tantric tradition, the Shiva worshiping branch of Hinduism. So here's what Carl Jung says. He says, Shiva, according to tantric doctrine, is the one existent, the timeless in its perfect state. Creation begins when this unextended point, known as Shiva Bindu, appears in the eternal em embrace of its feminine side, the Shakti. From Shakti comes Maya, the building material of all individual things. Creation therefore begins with an act of division of the opposites that are united in the deity. From their splitting arises in a gigantic explosion of energy, the multiplicity of the world. So I think it's pretty obvious the parallels between this, uh, the mandala uh, featuring the Shiva Bindu, this unextended point from which the universe explodes, the parallels with the Big Bang cosmology are pretty obvious. So another point I make in the book is that not only do, re do religions and philosophies emerge from the archetypes of the collective unconscious, but so do sciences, scientific theories, such as the Big Bang theory. Just like in religions, the source of the cosmos is featured as this mandala with an infinitely powerful unextended point in the center, Shiva. So too do we find the gravitational singularity in the Big Bang Theory. Um, in other branches of Hinduism, the Vaishnava branch, instead of Shiva in the center, it's Vishnu. But still the point is the God archetype is in the center of every universe and furthermore encompasses the horizon as the Akasha. Uh, the Sutratman, the thread soul, encompasses the outermost horizon where the past, present, and future are conserved and radiates it inward. That is, we, in the previous videos, we showed the same model of the cosmos in Hinduism. We showed it in Plato's cosmology. Here's an, an example that we just gave from the Shiva worshiping tradition of Hinduism. Um, so, and that is just one of the examples, and I'm not going to go over all of them in this video, I'm um, just trying to give a, a brief overview of the main points, but I think this next quote is helpful. So Jung goes on to say about 
the mandala images and what their purpose is, what, what they're trying to fulfill when they're appearing in your dreams and fantasies, he says, uh, there are innumerable variants of the motif shown here, but they're all based on the squaring of the circle. Their basic motif is the premonition of a center of personality, a kind of central point within the psyche to which everything is related, by which everything is arranged, and which is itself a source of energy. The energy of the central point is manifested in the almost irresistible compulsion and urge to become what one is. The center is not felt or thought of as the ego, but, if one may so express it as the self, although the center is represented by the innermost point, it is surrounded by a periphery containing everything that belongs to the self, the paired opposites that make up the total personality. So that's an important point. It's not only the innermost point, but it's also surrounded by a periphery containing everything that belongs to the self, which is a lot like the holographic horizon of the cosmos. So this totality comprises consciousness, first of all, then the personal unconscious, and finally, an indefinitely large segment of the collective unconscious, whose archetypes are common to all mankind. So there's a lot of parallels with the holographic string theory cosmology and that description of the mandalas, the mandala image symbolizing the self. So the main one is the central point is also connected with the surrounding, surrounding periphery, which contains everything that belongs to the self. Similarly, the singularity in the center of the universe contains all space and time, but the horizon of the cosmos, each point, contains all space and time as well, from which it radiates back inward. So we saw in previous videos Carl Jung and his near-death experience, Eben Alexander and his near-death experience, and Stanislav Grof during his first LSD experience with stroboscopic light being flashed at his optic nerve, they all experienced themselves ex expand out to the horizon of the cosmos where they felt themselves as one with the universe, the past, the present, and the future. So that's the periphery of the self that contains everything that belongs to the self. It seems that the self is one with the cosmos at a fundamental level, which is a, brings up an important philosophical point. Is there only one self or are there many selves? And I think the best answer is it's, it's simultaneously both. There's, as, as we've talked about before, the Leibniz's principle of the identity of indiscernibles, even though singularities appear everywhere throughout space and time, because each of them is out, is itself outside of space and time, by being the source and the end of space-time, they can't be differentiated spatially or temporally, so it's as if there's one singularity. So there are many, and there's one, um, and I, I'm not going to get in, into that very important philosophical point right now. The main thing I'm just trying to show out, uh, to show in this video, is how strongly Jung's theory of the mandala images of the self, the psychic mandala images, parallels Susskind's black hole, holographic black hole cosmology. And so there's that main point of the relationship between the central point and the outermost periphery, but also he says this totality comprises consciousness first of all, then the personal unconscious, and finally an indefinitely large segment of the collective unconscious. So that reminds me of Stanislav Grof's theory of the basic perinatal matrices, which we talked about in a previous video. The consciousness is the ego, and Jung gives another definition of the ego as the center of the field of light, which would imply the ego ends where the field of light ends, which is the cosmic horizon. So the center is the ego, then the personal unconscious, and then the collective unconscious. So the volume of space would be correlated with the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious with the horizon of the cosmos. When people recall these near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences, they say, oh, I, I felt as if I was rising above my body, and then I started to accelerate faster and faster uh, through a tunnel toward a brilliant point of light as my whole life flashed before my eyes. So if you look out in space, 
the farther you look out in space, the farther back in time you're looking. When you see the sun in the sky, it's actually where the sun was eight minutes ago. So if, as I've been discussing throughout these videos, the psyche is the source of space-time, and if space-time, if the nature of space-time is to expand, well then your personal biography is out in space. The farther out you look in space, the farther back into your own personal life you're looking. That's the personal unconscious mind or the memory of your past life. If psyche equals singularity and the ego is correlated with the central point and the unconscious, collective unconscious with the horizon, the personal unconscious is the space between and that does parallel these near-death experiences. You're literally going back into your personal, through your personal unconscious life, back through your birth and gestation period, ultimately to the birth of the universe at the horizon of the cosmos. Um, so, there's a, uh, I will be making a few more videos about Jung's mandala theory because it gets into things like imaginary numbers, the square roots of negative numbers, and how that ultimately evolved into the Riemann sphere, which is a very good example of Jung's mandala theory manifesting in the mathematical world. Uh, Jung talks about UFO uh, sightings as being instances of mandala images and... And he talks about his theory of the pleroma, which is this more ancient term for the outermost horizon, where the past, the present, and the future coexist. Um, but before, before I end this video, I just want to go to this next subsection of the chapter, and this one is Pauli individuation and mandala dreams. So, as I mentioned earlier, Jung had Pauli write down, document a thousand of his dreams and spontaneous fantasies, and then he analyzed them, uh, but he hid uh, Pauli's identity by calling him merely a young man of excellent scientific education, which is a major understatement. He's a Nobel Prize winning co-founder of quantum mechanics. But here is something that Jung said. Um, he opened that essay, which is based on his analysis of Pauli's dreams. This, the essay is Individual Dream Symbolism in Relation to Alchemy. He opens the essay by saying, The symbols of the process of individuation that appear in dreams are images of an archetypal nature which depict the centralizing process or the production of a new center of personality. The self is not only the center, but also the whole circumference, which embraces both conscious and unconscious. It is the center of this totality, just as the ego is the center of consciousness. So the self is not only the center, but also the whole circumference, which embraces both conscious and unconscious. It's just reiterating the, the correlation between the conscious and unconscious polarity of the self or of the psyche is equivalent to the polarity of the central singularity and encompassing horizon of the cosmos. I'm saying the collective unconscious is the cosmic horizon. The holographic memory bank of the universe is the collective unconscious mind. And the ego is the central point, but there's a, an, a subtle point to be made there. The self isn't the ego. The self is greater than the ego. The archetype of the self encompasses the ego and the horizon, whereas the ego is only seeing itself as the center of the field of light. In Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung writes that our basis is ego consciousness, our world, the field of light, centered upon the focal point of the ego. So the self is in the center of the ego, so the self is also the central singularity but the ego does not encompass the horizon of the cosmos. The whole self does, and the process of individuation, which is a word that was there at the beginning of that essay about uh, you know, featuring Pauli's dreams, for, for Carl Jung, individuation is the psychological process of self-realization. The developmental process a psyche has to go through in order to unite the opposite poles of the self. The conscious and, and the unconscious mind, as well as the private and the public life. So first, in the first process of individuation is living up to the basic standards of your community. 
developing a persona, but then you need to differentiate, differentiate yourself from the demands of society and also from the demands of the archetypes of the collective unconscious mind. You are separate from them to some degree. So that's, so you first need to become an autonomous ego, separate yourself from society and from the collective society of the archetypes, but then you need to reintegrate those two opposing poles in yourself. And that's the definition of the archetype of the self. It's the union of all opposites, which is a point Jung repeats again and again. That's the self is the union of all opposites. And all pairs of opposites can be cons are contained in the equation psyche equals singularity because an opposite is either mental or physical. You can be either happy or sad. That's a psychological pair of opposites. Or things can be hot or cold. That's a material pair of opposites. If all that exists in the cosmos is mind and matter, then all pairs of opposites are going to be contained in either one or the other of those two groups. Psyche equals singularity unites those two groups and thereby automatically uniting all pairs of opposites. So that's uh, an important point that um, the self is this union of all pairs of opposites culminating with the union of the conscious and the unconscious, which is equivalent to the singularity and the horizon of the cosmos. That when you understand yourself as being one with the central singularity and horizon of the cosmos, that would seem to me to fulfill Jung's idea of what individuation is. And that is what he did during his near-death experience in 1944 when he broke his foot, had a heart attack, and then ultimately experienced himself interwoven with the past, the present, and the future of the whole cosmos, blissfully at the horizon of the cosmos, from where, he said, it seemed as everyone living in material bodies was imprisoned in a little box of three-dimensional space, which was tethered to the horizon by a thread. That's the main parallel between Jung psychology and Susskind string theory that I say it has no other reasonable explanation other than the one that Jung and Pali gave to this kind of a parallel, and that's physics and psychology parallel each other because they're both rooted in the same source. The psychoid archetypes, neither they're neither psychic nor material because they're the source of both. So that, uh, I think, um, will be enough for this installation. And in the next videos, I'll be going over, as I said before, Jung's theory of the Pleroma, his ideas about UFO sightings, and I'll get into the parallels between Jung's mandala theory and the evolution of mathematical physics, especially dealing with imaginary numbers, the square roots of negative numbers. Oh, oh, oh.